The tribes of the steppe were famous for their ability to recite their ancestors back generations with pride, although this is an ability far from unique to them. Lineage held great importance to the tribes as it determined your position on the social hierarchy, the relations between tribes, and which tribes and individuals could claim higher status and nobility. The Mongols specifically, as told in the Secret History of the Mongols, written some time after Chinggis' death, trace their origins to the union of the blue gray wolf and the fallow deer, Forte Chino and Guamoral in Mongolian. The secret history then traces the descendants of the wolf and the deer, all humans, mind you, and how they split into the various Mongol clans, mainly concerned with what would become the Borzigan line, being, as it was, an explanation of Chinggis's ancestry. The line of the wolf and deer continued unbroken for generations until Dobun, Mergen, and his wife Alan the Fair, who had two sons before Dobun's death. After his death, according to legend and the secret history, Alan was then impregnated by a beam of light sent from heaven, a parallel of sorts to Jesus' immaculate conception. Elan in the beam of light would have three more sons. The youngest and most important was Hodonchar Munkag, which meant which meant which, sorry, which meant Hodonchar the Simple. And despite his epithet, he was a rather hallowed figure and is considered the founder of the Borzigan line. The name Borzigan, by the way, came from Bodonchar's grandfather, Borzadai Merigan, uh, which meant Borzadai the Wise. Now, the historicity of Bodonchar and his forebears is rather uncertain, and naturally, the likelihood of a wolf and a deer producing a human child is rather questionable. But with Bodonchar's great-great-grandson Kaidu, the Borzigids and the Mongols emerge into certainty around 1050 to 1100 Common Era, appearing in contemporary Chinese writings. Kaidu ruled the Mongols in a loose confederation and would divide his territory among his sons uh, after his death, which would begin to disunify the Mongols. His descendants would split into the two chief clans of the Mongols, continuing the Borzigid line as well as the new Taichid line. Kaidu's great-grandson Kabul, or who also happens to have, to have been Temujin's great-grandfather, was the next figure of importance in the Borzigid line. Kabul appears to have united the Mongols in another loose military coalition in the 1120s and 1190s, sorry, 1130s, called the Kamag Mongol, and he was either the ruler or just the most dominant Khan, it's a little, con it's a little unsure, um, until his death in 1150. A man with a monumental appetite, he apparently visited, visited the new Jin dynasty in China a number of times, attending the coronation of an emperor, and on another occasion, at a banquet, he got so drunk he got up and pulled on the emperor's beard. The Jin would recognize his talent, however, and would try to pin him down as a vassal. Kabul refused, and war would break out between the Jin and the Mongol but the Jin would be unable to beat him militarily whenever they entered the steppe. Oddly, and with long-lasting consequences, Kabul would pass the Khanite not to any of his seven children, but to his tight shield cousin, Ambakai. The Tachiud would take from this, but they were the more prestigious clan compared to the Borzigan, which would wear down the already brittle Kamag Mongol. Ambakai would also fight the Jin, who decided they couldn't defeat him militarily. So when Ambahai would bring his daughter to the Tartars for a marriage alliance in 1156, the Tartars would capture him and hand him over to the Jin. Uh, you may remember from my last video how I mentioned the Tartars were vassals of the Jin. Well, here's where it starts. Allegedly, Ambahai would call on the Mongols to not rest until they had avenged him, and he would be crucified to a wooden donkey by the Jin a humiliation the Mongols would not forget. The Khanite would then pass to Hutala, a Borjidid and one of Kabul's sons. Hutala does not appear to have had the support of the Taichiud, however. Without them, his attempts to avenge Ambachai were in vain. He is said to have fought 13 indecisive battles against the Tartars, too weak to overcome them without Taichiud support. In 1161, the Jin decided to strike marching onto the steppe alongside their Tartar vassals 
and shattering whatever remains of the Kamakamongo Confederation at the Battle of Lake Bure. At this point, Hutala disappears from the historical record, and we presume he was killed in the battle, or at least shortly thereafter. That was the end of any large-scale, intertribal Mongol unity before Chinggis, the Borjigin and the Taichid now too far apart to come together. Even in the final years of his life, Hutala's nephew Esigai abandoned him, joining up with the Karyad leader Toguru, possibly an attempt to eventually take control of the Mongols himself with outside help. Esigai and Toguru would become Andas, blood brothers, and Esigai would help overthrow Toguru's uncle, the Gurkhan, who had usurped the leadership of the Karyad. Esigai would find himself in charge of his own small band of families and warriors, both Taichud and Borjigid, and live his life womanizing and raiding. For instance, around 1150 to 1190, sorry, 1159 to 1160, Esugai stole a woman named Ulun from her American husband. Shortly thereafter, while on campaign against the Tartars, he would capture a Tartar chief named Temujinuj. Esugai would return to Ulun around 1162 with his prize and find her just about to give birth to their eldest child. In a ceremony likely involving the Tartars' execution, they will give his name to their new son, Temujin, the future Chinggis Khan.